Beginning at verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remains. Now, I'm going to lay a couple of things uh, by way of remembrance as an introduction, and then we'll move into the verses before us. But uh, we closed by looking at an argument that had occurred between a, a formerly blind man and some religious leaders. The man had been born blind, but Jesus had healed him completely. And as we saw last time we were together, we saw that that had infuriated the religious leaders who believed that Jesus was really a blasphemer. And so they began to argue with this man. And they began to claim to this man that, that Jesus was a sinner. And so as they were speaking concerning that, they wanted the man to agree with them. But there was no way that, that he could do so. You see, he had been blind. Now he was healed. And they couldn't deny it. So he said that he had never heard of anyone opening the eyes of one who had been born blind. And, and he said that if Jesus uh, were not from God, he could do nothing. And so in verse 34, they answered and they said to him, you were completely born in sins and, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. You know, obviously they were alluding to the fact that they believed that this man had been born in sin. His blindness was congenital. It was actually sin-related, and that's the point that they're making. But one little thought about that and then move on. Uh, you were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? You know, that's, a, that's really a testimony a lot of us have, to be honest with you. When you get saved, you know, yeah, we, we were born obviously as sinners. That's an obvious Reality, Scripture makes it very clear. There's none good, no, not one. All of us are sinners by nature. We don't become sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. It's in our nature to sin. We are ch children of darkness. But the Lord Jesus Christ has saved us. He opened our eyes. We at one time were spiritually blind. We didn't see him for who he is. And then the Lord, through the gospel, by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, when we received Christ, our eyes were open, and yet we go and we speak to people sometimes and we share with them about what God has done in our life. And the first thing they want to say is, you were born in sin and you're now preaching to us? You, you're a person who's known for your testimony, for the things that you've done, and now you're going to come and preach to me? You know what? That's, that's how a lot of us were. That's how I was when I first got saved because of the life I lived prior to Christ. You know, that could be said of me. You were born in sin. You're a sinner. And you're coming here like some self-righteous person to tell me how I ought to live. But you know what? We, 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 are, we are not self-righteous when we love people enough to tell them the truth. And we're not self-righteous when we, when we share from the point of someone who's been touched by the Lord. And our eyes have been opened by God. And we want other people to see also. But some people's hearts are so hardened, they just don't want to receive that which is being said. And so what they did here is they, they closed their ears to him. They, they blamed his blindness on his sin. And then they cast him out. Verse 35 says that they had cast him out. In verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And so he hadn't seen Jesus, by the way. He wouldn't know what he looked like. And so he wasn't seeking Jesus out at that time. Jesus was seeking him out. Jesus does that, by the way. We've seen that in Scripture. We've seen that in the Gospel of John. Jesus has a way of seeking sinners out. We, we saw that when Jesus was on his way to uh, uh, on a trip, and, and he had to go through Samaria. We saw that in, in chapter 4. And it simply said in chapter 4, verse 5 of John's gospel that he needed to go through Samaria. 
And we know that geographically, whenever the Jews would travel from, from the Galilee to Judah, when they go south or north, that they would uh, go through Samaria, or as I mentioned with, to you before, they would go across to the east, they would cross the Jordan River, and they would bypass that region of Samaria because the Jews had no dealings with, Samar with Samaritans and all of that. But we saw that when we were in John chapter 4 that Jesus needed to go to Samaria. Why? Because there was a woman by the well that he was seeking out in order that he might be able to set her free. Jesus has a way of seeking people out. Jesus sought this man out like he sought out the cripple there that was at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5 and verse 6 where it's, the scripture says when Jesus saw him, saw this man there, when he saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Jesus saw the crippled man. The crippled man wasn't looking for Jesus. He sought him out. Why? Because Jesus says in Luke 19, 10, that he's come to seek and to save the lost. The man had said that Jesus was a prophet, and therefore he was excommunicated for it. The man had been cast out of the synagogue. He was abandoned by his parents. But Jesus sought him out, and Jesus found him. If you want to take a scriptural note, Psalm 2710 is a beautiful scripture to remember. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Isn't that a fact? When my family and my friends want nothing to do with me, the Lord doesn't forsake me. He's always with me. So Jesus, according to verse 35, found him. And notice what he says. He said, do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe? Uh, do you look for Messiah? Are you looking for his coming to save you? Do you believe? And in verse 36, he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? So notice with me, by the way he answers, he's ready to believe. He's ready to receive what Jesus is saying. He simply says, show me who he is. And so Jesus' response in verse 37 is, you've both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Once again, I had to point something out by way of application in verse 36. The man answered and said, who is he, that I may believe in him? Again, that's part of what we do. That's the role of the ministers that we are. We're all called by God to take the gospel and share it. You'll be surprised. I'm sure that many of you have already discovered this. But you will be surprised if you haven't yet how many people are really open to hearing about Christ. You know, we, we hear constantly, blaringly, really, that people aren't, aren't wanting to hear about God, um, that this younger generation has no interest, and that's just absolutely not true whatsoever. That is not true whatsoever. A friend of mine, uh, all of you would know by name probably, Ryan Reese, uh, Raw Reese's son, has a ministry called the Whosoever's, and uh, I was with him um, the other day, I was being interviewed uh, by him for a, a radio broadcast that he has, and we we're talking about the Jesus movement at all, and as we were talking about it, he was sharing with me some things about what he's seen as he goes out to high schools, and he showed me some pictures. He said, you ought to see this. This took place, and he gave him the name of the high school. I forget which one it is, but he showed me a picture. He said, this is what took place, and he shows me the, the stands because this is an event taking place in a high school, and it stands uh, in a basketball court kind of setting. You know, he's preaching towards um, the stands and all, and there's a good amount of, of young people, high schoolers, in the stands. He says, every one of those young people, when I gave the invitation, every one came forward. And he shows me pictures. You know, he just didn't just say it. He showed me pictures, and you see the kids who are walking down and you see Ryan standing there with all the kids from the stands standing around him. I am telling you, don't give up hope. I am telling you, don't give up on this generation. Don't give up on them. People gave up on our generation. They gave up on us, hippies and whatever else came after us. You know, they're a bunch of off-scouring, bunch of, you know, they need to take a bath and get a job, put up some shoes. They need to cut their hair, people. People gave up on us. But God didn't. And you know what? When Jesus is ministering to him, he simply says, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? There are people who want to know who he is. This man had been touched in a miraculous way. He now sees. He doesn't realize he's speaking to the one who touched him. But he says, who is he that I may believe? 
Our job is to present to them Jesus, that they might see him and trust him. That's something we really need to do, and we need to do that regularly. And so, as he's doing that, we need to remember that Jesus had healed him, but he still needs to be saved. And so, as he's speaking to him, Jesus, verse 37, says, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. You don't have to go looking for him. He's standing right before you. You need a relationship with me. And the man's response, I believe. His expectant faith became his saving faith. And notice what happens here. Verse 38, he worshipped him. I want to look at that for just a moment. He worshipped him. That is what has been called the proper response on his part. Because his worship to Christ is the expression of faith in Jesus. And all genuine believers in Jesus Christ worship him. We do so because his blessings lead us to give him our thanks and our praise. Our eyes have been opened. And it's right to worship him for his goodness to us. And that is the proper way to treat Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't only a man. He's not simply a prophet. He's not only a wise teacher. He's our Messiah. He's God in the flesh. Now, in this Christmas season, uh, it is understood that, that, uh, that we would remember for a moment the, the act of the wise men. Uh, remember in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, when the wise men were searching for Christ, it, it says that they asked, where is the newborn king of the Jews? They said, we saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. And that's what believers do. Believers worship him. And I want you to note something. It's instructive that Jesus didn't rebuke him for worshiping him. There are those who say, oh, no, you, you don't worship Christ. But Jesus did not rebuke him for doing that. He accepted his worship. Why? Because, again, he's worthy of our worship. Now, remember, Jesus taught us to worship God and to serve God alone. Remember how the enemy, Satan, was tempting him. And at one point... Um, he had, he had said, uh, I'll give you everything if you simply bow down and worship me. And what was Jesus' response? In Matthew 4, verse 10, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Jesus taught, and Jesus said it in way of rebuke to Satan, that God is to be worshipped. And yet, and this is an important point, by the way, I hope I'm making it clear, we worship Jesus Christ. We have people who knock on the door sometimes and tell us, no, you only worship God. Jesus is not to be worshipped. But Jesus received worship. We're seeing it right here. We're hearing it in the words of the wise men, and it is wise to worship him. And they said, we have seen a star. We have come to worship him. In this instance here, as this man is worshiping him, it's not just giving him homage or giving him great respect. What he is doing is actually worshiping him, and Jesus is receiving it. This is what happens. Jesus receives worship. When you look in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 14, we see the story of Jesus walking on water during a storm. And we know the disciples, as is mentioned in, the, in that passage, the disciples are afraid because they're, they're going to drown. And so as this is all taking place and the storm is rising and, and all the apostle Peter is there in that, that, that ship, that boat, and uh, when he begins to be afraid, they say, well, it's the Lord. And, and Peter says, it, if it is you, Lord, then uh, command that I should climb out of this boat and walk towards you. And, uh, and Jesus says, well, come on. And I, I love that story because I picture myself as one of the other apostles, to be honest with you. Because I'd have been yelling, go for it, Peter, you can do it. <laughs> but I, I'd have stayed in the boat, man. There's no way I'm getting out. You can do it, Peter. We believe in you. And then Thomas says, I doubt it. You know, so. But as he does, he climbs out. And he does the impossible. And, and, and he, he, he's, you know, he, he is saved. And, and you remember how that when they turn and begin to go back to the boat, that the apostle begins to sink. And, and Jesus begins to bring some rebukes for all of that. And they enter into the boat. And when he entered into the boat... Jesus rebuked their lack of faith, and the wind ceased. And it says in Matthew 14, verse 33, those 
who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. After Jesus was resurrected, Mary Madeline and the other Mary were sent to the apostles. And on their way after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to them, commanding them to rejoice. And in Matthew 28, verse 9, their response was, they came and held him by the feet and they worshiped him. It is right for us to worship him. And again, notice with me here, Jesus didn't forbid that from taking place. If it were not right, he would have rebuked any who offered him worship. And he receives worship, and that's why we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? You can almost hear the sarcasm in their voices. Are we blind also? The arrogance, the self-righteousness, the disrespect. Are we blind also? And Jesus, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. But now you say we see. Therefore, your sin remains. That's strong. That's a very direct statement. If you were blind, you would have no sin. Now remember, Jesus in verse 39, uh, for judgment I've come into this world. Now, he came into the world to save it, but the effect is to reveal every man's true condition. The light reveals the stains that were unseen. His light reveals the sin in the hearts of men. Tax gatherers and sinners were unable to see, while those who claimed to be enlightened were left in darkness because they closed their eyes and they refused to see. They refused to see. There is a willing, a willful rejection. You don't want to believe what you're seeing. There are people who willfully reject. They, they, in their heart, they know, and yet they decide to not follow. There are people who will say that. Yeah, I believe. I, I remember speaking to, to somebody once. Actually, this happened more than once. It's happened at least twice that I can recall, where I have spoken and shared as a young believer with a uh, I remember in particular one friend of mine that I was sharing with, and, uh, and this is the conversation. I hope it's not offensive to some, but this is the conversation. He said to me, he said, I was raised, uh, he was Catholic. He said, I was raised in the Catholic Church, Dave, as you know. He said, and uh, what you're saying I know is true. And I said, why don't you receive Christ if you know it's true? I mean, that was, he, was, he was dear enough for me to be able to speak honestly with him. Why don't you receive Christ if you know that it's true? And he says, because uh, it would offend my mom. I said, so you're willing to go to hell for your mother? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, I wasn't willing to go to hell for my mother, but I was willing to take my mother to heaven. You need to tell her the truth, but you need to embrace the truth yourself. But there are people who will tell you that. No, I know what you're saying is true. Then you say, why don't you trust? It offends other people. I'm not ready. I'll maybe later. They have all these excuses. And so there are people, and you know them. Perhaps you were that way yourself for a while. Maybe maybe you, you, you've, you've had encounters with them, but that's true. And so they close their eyes, and they're refusing. There's a willful rejection. And so Jesus in verse 41 says, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. You see, they claim to see, yet they close their eyes. And so they're guilty of what has been called rejecting the light. They remained in spiritual darkness. They refused to see. It's been rightly said, our responsibility is measured by our opportunities. In Proverbs 28, 13, the scripture says, he who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. These people covered their sin. They would not confess and they would not reject. And that's why Jesus said, your sin remains. So now we move into chapter 10 in verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, 
the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they don't know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they didn't understand the things which he spoke to them. Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And so Jesus has sought out this blind man. Jesus found him. And in doing so, he adopted the role of a shepherd seeking out a lost sheep. Now, that's what we're looking at because Jesus is going to be referring to himself as the good shepherd, and we'll be seeing that. But this image of shepherd is used a variety of ways in Scripture. If you take notes, you might want to remember this. The shepherd, the image of a shepherd is used in various ways. One, the image of a shepherd is actually used concerning God himself. God is referred to in Scripture as a shepherd. We all know Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In Psalm 95, verse 7, he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. So on the one hand, you'll find God mentioned several times in the Old Testament as the shepherd. And so you see the image of shepherd used by God, the one who cares for sheep. But secondly, the image of the shepherd is used of Messiah. Isaiah 40, verse 11 says, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, carry them in his bosom, shall gently lead those who are with young. And so God himself is, is portrayed as an, in the image, with the image of a, a shepherd, but Jesus is also, and we'll see that uh, in more detail later on in this chapter. But Jesus is also, used, uh, is also referred to as, as a shepherd. He's the Messiah. But third, there's a third way that the image is used, and that's interesting in that it is used also in reference to false teachers. They're called false shepherds. You see it especially in Ezekiel 34. But in Jeremiah 23, 1 and 2, it says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And so you see God as the shepherd, Jesus as a shepherd, and you see the false teachers portrayed as shepherds. They're false shepherds. They're harmful. In this passage, Jesus is calling Pharisees false shepherds. Instead of feeding and caring for God's people, they're driving them away. And Jesus is the true shepherd. He seeks for his lost sheep, even as he sought for that blind man. In Luke, remember in Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through 6, Jesus speaks of a, a shepherd that left a, a hundred sheep in order that he might seek out the one. That's what Jesus portrays himself as in Scripture. And so what we're going to see here in John 10 is Jesus being revealed as the door as well as Jesus referring to himself as the good shepherd. Now, I've mentioned this to you, but it bears repetition. In John's gospel, John records what are called the seven I am statements of Jesus Christ. We've already seen John 6.35 where he said, I am the bread of life. In John 8, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. Later in chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then John 15, 1, I am the true vine. In these verses before us, Jesus says, I am the door. And he goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. So we're going to be looking at, at Jesus as the good shepherd in our next study. But today, he refers to himself as the door. So in verse 1, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, let me develop this with you, and it becomes much more clear as I do so. Jesus is making it clear that the true shepherd has a right to enter what is called the sheepfold. That's what he's saying. He is saying, I say to you in verse 1, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door climbs up some other way. He's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd. So Jesus is making it very clear that true shepherds have the right to enter what is called the sheepfold. Now, a sheepfold, when you think of a sheepfold, in the, in the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel being an agricultural nation during the time of Christ especially, you would have a village, a community, and in the village you had what would be called the community sheepfold. So you might have uh, some sheep in your, you know, in, in, under your care, and there'd be others perhaps who had sheep under their care. And what you had was you had a, a big pen where the, um, where the sheep would be cared for, and you would bring your sheep into the pen at night, and you had a doorkeeper. The doorkeeper was a guard. So the guard would be there keeping watch for the sheep to make sure that, that predators didn't kill them and thieves didn't enter in and steal them. And so you had the community guard, somebody who was pulling guard, who was there as the one who was stationed to protect it. Now, they'd be in an open courtyard, but they were able to be protected from bad weather. They were also in that area there to be cared for to be saved from the thieves and predators. And so the owner, Jesus is saying, never had to sneak in because he owned the sheep. And so as he would go, the guard, he would walk up to the guard, the guard would recognize him and he'd allow him entrance. And that's the point that he's making. So here's how he's going to develop it. And this is very, this is a, a beautiful image and I'm hoping to be able to present it to you in a way that that makes some sense and actually kind of blesses your heart the way it does mine. Because the thief and the robber, well, that person would have to find a way to sneak in. And so he couldn't come in through the guard. But the question is, I don't know about you. I wonder how many shepherds I might have in here. You never know. I might have a shepherd or two in here. What would happen is um, I'm not one of these experts in what sheep look like. They pretty much, they all look the same to me when they're on a shish kebab or on a plate. They all look pretty much the same. They don't look much different. And they're good. We call, but anyway, um, how do you know the difference? How would you know the difference? They all look the same. And Jesus is actually going to give us some, some, something here that's very, I think, very interesting. You see, the sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd. And I want to show you this. It says, verse 3, To him the doorkeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. He leads them out. When he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. They will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. The sheep hear his voice. If you are one of the sheep of the Lord, you learn to hear his voice. Remember in John eight forty seven, how he who is of God hears God's words? You do not hear because you're not of God. One of the ways that you can know that you're, you belong to the Lord, do you hear his voice? Is your, is your ear attentive to his voice? And I'm not saying, you know, that out in the middle of the night you're going to hear or whatever. You, you, but, but, I, but are you are you attentive to his voice? How do you hear the voice of God? We, we live in a time, and I'll just touch this briefly, but we live in a time where people are actually thinking they hear the voice of the Lord by the way they feel. Their emotions have a lot to do with whether or not they think God is speaking to them. 
How do you hear the voice of the Lord? And has your emotions, have your emotions ever lied to you? Have you ever felt emotionally something was true and in fact it wasn't true, but because you really believed that it was true and felt that it was true, but you find out later on it wasn't? If you haven't, then you probably didn't date much in high school because your emotions lied to you all the time. She likes me. I know she likes me. I feel she likes me. No, she didn't like you. And you found that out later on, right? But all your emotions said she liked you. You know, our emotions do lie to us. That's why it's important for us not to build lives on emotions. And yet, I, I'm sorry to say this, but it is a true observation, and it's recorded by those who do this as a living, that the generation that we're trying to reach right now is very much more emotion-laden. They, they want to feel God, not know Him, and that makes it very difficult because the way to know God isn't through your feelings because your feelings can lie. I mean, you can feel that God is speaking to you and really be sure of it, and all it is is you ate too much chili. <laughs> you can have a burning heart, but it's heartburn. <laughs> and so you have to be very careful with that. You, you have to put your emotions under the supervision of the Word because you can feel saved today and not saved tomorrow simply by whether you slept well last night. That's a fact. You can feel in love now and, 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 and not in love tomorrow simply by your diet. I mean, you can't go by your emotions. There's got to be something that's deeper than emotion. So what is it? What is it that helps me to know God? God's word. How do I hear his voice? By reading his word. That's what we're doing tonight. Every time we read, we're reading the scripture here, we're hearing his voice He's speaking to us, and Jesus is saying, the one who doesn't want to hear it, doesn't want to hear it, not because that person's boring. He doesn't want to hear it because he doesn't know the voice of the master. That's the problem. You know, I come from a generation that, that wanted truth. You know, we wanted truth, and I, know, I think that's true with many generations, and probably the same one, even as I'm speaking now, the, one that, the current one. There's a, there's a need for truth. And for us, when I went to listen to my pastor, Chuck, Chuck was not a riveting speaker. Chuck didn't, my pastor wasn't somebody who, who perspired and, and cried and, and, and patrolled the, the platform and was excited. He gave me solid truth to build my life on. And I learned very early in my spiritual life that I couldn't trust my emotions. I had to trust God's word. I had to know what he said, and then I had to hold fast to that. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. And the Bible says that Jesus said it. He who is of God hears God's words. And then he said to those who are rejecting him, you don't hear because you're not of God. You're not hungry for what God has to say. So he says, my sheep hear my voice. And that's what Jesus is portraying to us here in this illustration. The sheep hear his voice. They recognize his call to them. So if you're one of Jesus' sheep, you hear his voice. And second, he says he calls his own sheep by name. Special knowledge of them. That's what he's speaking of. He knows them and he knows their habits. And he calls each sheep individually. And he pays special attention to them. He pays attention to them. He watches them. Any parent here knows what Jesus is referring to. If you have one child, mm, that's good. But if you have two or three or four, you learn some lessons. Because they're not all the same, are they? Parents with more than one. If you have one, and, and if you have one real sweet, wonderful, lovely child first, you might take all the credit for how good they are. You are an awesome parent, aren't you? But it's their disposition. They're just easy to handle. Then you have a second one. <laughs> and then you realize how bad your wife has been raising the kids. <laughs> it's her fault. No, and, and you see, <laughs> what happens is you begin to realize that each one has a distinct personality. You have one child that the discipline you, you bring on them may be the, you know, may be the belt. It may be a, a paddle, you know, and that gets their attention. The other one, all you need to do is look at them. And you look at them and you just shake your head. My son David, when he was a kid, I would spank him and he had attitude. And he would look at me, and he'd be like, is that the best you got? That was David. 
But Joseph, my other son, son, very disappointed in you. And he'd, I still remember him. He'd ball up his little fists and he'd look at me and he'd cry. I'm sorry, Dad. I didn't mean to do that. Different kids. I never spanked him. He lies and says I spanked him once. He's a liar. If he ever tells you that, <laughs> I should have spanked that out of him. <laughs> but you learn their habits. You learn their ways. The parents learn the ways of the children. You learn their ways. It's wise if you observe and study them. Husbands are to learn the ways of their wives. Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, is what Peter says. What does that mean? Learn her ways. Get to know her. Because when she says something like, are you going to leave that there? That really means pick it up. <laughs> Learn her ways. Because a man will say, yeah, I might. <laughs> you asked me a question, I gave you the answer. That's not what she's saying. So you learn her ways, right? I mean, that's life by itself. That's just life. If you want to get along with people, learn their ways. Be an observer. Watch them. Talk to them. Listen to them. Observe them. Especially those that matter the most in your life. Because it helps you to get along. Well, the shepherds observed the sheep. And he would know. And that sheep would know the shepherd. Now, how did the sheep know the shepherd? By the voice. The sheep actually learned who the shepherd was because the shepherd would speak to the sheep. And he would actually name them because he would see things in the behavior of that little sheep that he would call them a little name. They had a nickname. A lot of people grew up with nicknames. I, I had one I won't give to you. Um, all my children have pet names and nicknames. Everyone, some have more than one name that I will call them. And it's my voice when they hear my voice calling them by that name. They know daddy's speaking to them. When they hear my voice calling them by their pet name, by what they are to me. We have that. It's just a natural thing that many of us have involved, been involved in. And that's what he's speaking about. He said he calls his own sheep by name. He knows them intimately. He knows their ways. He knows their habits. He knows you, by the way. He knows your ways and your habits. And he pays special attention. Then he says, he leads them out and goes before them, bringing them, in other words, to their destination. He doesn't drive them. He leads them. He gently leads them. And he does so as an example, not as a tyrant. He, he, it says in Psalm 23, verse 2, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He leads them. He goes before them. I've told you this old story of somebody who was in Israel, and while they were in Israel, they saw uh, what they thought was the shepherd walking, and the shepherd was actually behind the sheep, and the sheep were proceeding in front of him, and the shepherd had a, a, a rod, and he was hitting the sheep that were trailing in the back, and he would hit them and yell at them, and it would cause them to move. And this tourist, first time in Israel, he sees this guy hitting them, and, and the sheep are running, and they're being mistreated. And this, this tourist turns to the guide, and he says to him, I, I, I thought the shepherds went before the sheep, because that's what Jesus is speaking about here. He goes before them, and he leads them. I thought that the shepherd went before the sheep. Uh, wasn't there a time that that was true? And the guide says, oh, no, that's still true. The shepherd still does go before the sheep. But that's not the shepherd. That's the butcher. And so there's the driving that comes from the one who doesn't love. There's the leading that comes from the one who does love. And Jesus is our shepherd. He doesn't walk behind us with a stick to break us. He calls us by name. He knows us. He knows our habits. He knows the way we are. And he applies that knowledge to help us to bend our will to his. And so he goes before them. He guides them. He leads them out. He's gentle. And again, in verse 4, four it says, The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. They know his voice. When a sheep 
very often would, would be birthed, when a lamb would be birthed, the shepherd could be there in attendance of the birth of the lamb. And so the mama is giving birth to her baby. And the shepherd would be there when this was taking place very often because he knew when she was about to give birth. They, they knew that. There were seasons for that. And so the shepherd would be in there attending to the birth of the lamb. And when the lamb would be born and separate from the womb, the shepherd would take the sheep and would begin to dry it off and would hold it and would begin to bond with it. You can't picture this really, but that's what they would do. And he would speak to it and he would even begin to, 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 to talk to the little lamb wife so that the lamb would begin to imprint his voice. So from the moment it parted the womb, the shepherd spoke to it. And that sheep, that baby lamb, that little lamb, began to recognize the voice of the shepherd. And so as he raised, as the sheep would grow from, from being a lamb to a sheep, it knew the voice of the shepherd. It shows a tender knowledge and concern on the part of Jesus for you. Because when you were born again, he bonded with you. And you began to hear his voice. And you will not follow the voice of someone else. See, somebody, when you get saved, even when you're first saved and you open your heart to Christ and you say, yes, Lord, save me. Don't be surprised if someone knocks on your door bringing a different message. Don't be surprised if you go to, to work and, and somebody starts inviting you to go and hear this latest teaching or this, this new guru or guru or whatever. That happens. The enemy wants to bring a false shepherd into your life to draw you away from the true shepherd. But even as a young believer, I had some people come to my door. I wasn't more than two or three weeks old in Christ at the very most. I'd already started reading the Bible. I, I was taught, you pick up the book and you read it. And so I read it every night. I was reading the Bible, going to Bible studies, reading the Bible, going to Bible studies. And there's a knock on the door. I open the door. There are two people there. They begin to speak to me. And as they're speaking to me, they're saying things I've never heard. I've been reading my Bible, never saw it there. And that's the first time I ever had a cult member trying to witness to me to bring me into their way of thinking. That was the very first time. And I was two, maybe three weeks old in Jesus. And I still remember, as they were speaking to me, I still remember I didn't have answers for them. I'm a brand new Christian. I, I'm just learning to read the Bible. I'm just learning to be a Christian. But the Spirit of God who dwells within you can give you a sense of discernment. This is not true. And I remember looking at these two ladies and, and saying to them, you know, I don't think I agree with you. I said, I don't think what you're saying to me is right. Oh, it is, because the Bible says, well, you know, that's what you say, and I don't want to start a problem with you here, you know. But I don't agree with you. I think you're wrong. And later on, I discover as I'm reading my Bible, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who gives you discernment, where you say, this is, my mom used to use this phrase, it's tin. This, this is not solid. This isn't real. This isn't genuine. There's something wrong with this. That's the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, you will not follow the voice of a false shepherd. You won't follow him. His followers don't do that. Verse 5, they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. Jesus' sheep know his voice and will reject the voice of a false shepherd. But again, that requires bonding with the shepherd through reading his word and knowing him. Genuine Christians recognize false shepherds. And what is Jesus referring to them as? Thieves and robbers. These false shepherds may even occupy a pulpit, but they do not occupy a place in the heart of a true Christian. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, speaking of false teachers, he says they are of the, wor of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. And he goes on to say, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
And so when the teaching of the word goes forth, a false teacher goes and speaks and people will follow him because they're not of Christ. But a true believer will not follow him. The true believer will follow the words of Christ. And when they're rightly divided, will recognize the truth in them. So we're to be alert for those who, who would rob us or, or harm us. And that's what false teachers do, by the way. They rob and they harm. And so in verse 6, Jesus used this illustration. And they didn't understand the things which he spoke to them. Um, now, when it says they did not understand, who is it that didn't understand? Well, that would be the Pharisees who had just asked him if they were blind. They didn't understand spiritual truth because they were not his sheep. So Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief doesn't come except to steal and kill and to destroy. I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus is the door of the sheep. You see, they're not understanding completely here. So he's explaining spiritual things. And he's pointing out that he's the only way into the abundant life of the Spirit of God. False teachers and unfaithful leaders preceding him could not give life to the sheep because they didn't have words of life. You see, all a false teacher can give you is spiritual bondage. That's all you'll get. When Marie, my wife, was first saved, she had a roommate, and her roommate had a sister. And her sister had gotten involved in a group called the Children of God. How many of you have ever heard the children of God? Isn't this interesting? The children of God were one of the most well-known cults in the 70s. I, I, well, I could tell you stories about this. So I have to be very careful to try and remain on point. Oh, forget it. I'll tell you some stories. No. Um, <laughs> when I first got saved, people would go to Hollywood. A lot of people would go to Hollywood and they would witness. That Why Hollywood, I don't know. But my friends, a lot of people would drive up to Hollywood and they'd go up and down the boulevard and they would, they would hand out tracts. Uh, all of you have probably heard of Elton John. Elton John sings of Jesus freaks out in the streets handing tickets out for God. That's what he was talking about. He was talking about the Jesus freaks who were out there in Hollywood and, you know, handing out tickets for God. They were tracks. So that's how much the Jesus movement infiltrated even, even the current music of the day. That's how much we impacted. Well, where there is good, there's evil present also. And so when the gospel was going out through genuine hippies who had gotten saved, Jesus people, there were people who were starting cults. There was the Tony and Susan Alamo Foundation, and there was the... Uh, children of God, later on called the family of love. They changed their name. They followed a leader named Moses David. Moses David eventually was so sick and so pathetic that he began to have incestuous relationships with his grandchildren and children, grandchildren. And he would put out tracts that were, they were called red letter tracts that his words were in red, equal to the voice of Jesus Christ. His group was having people who were a young woman who would be given to another, a young man in marriage, even if they didn't even really know him. They would say, you're going to marry this person. And they actually joined them together when there was no love, commitment, relationship. They, would just, they were doing that. They had the young women in the children of God who were called flirty fishes. They used to go flirty fishing. And that meant that they would go, the girls from the cult, and they would seduce young men, and they would bring them back to the communes. They'd have physical relations with them. That's why they called it flirty fishing, in order to steal them and bring them to the commune. It was a very evil, evil group of people, very evil. And Marie's roommate had a sister who was involved in that cult. 
And Marie went with her sister to go and save her. Where, what, where, where was the city? Do you remember? Was it by Bakersfield? In that? They went to Bakersfield and went and delivered this girl from that bondage. Listen, when you, when you look at cults and you, you hear the word cult and all, you may be thinking, oh, that's kind of harmless. It's not. It's destructive. It steals your soul. They're false teachers, and they destroy. They come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what Jesus is teaching us in this passage. Now, he's referring directly to the false teachers who are rejecting what he has to say. They're not hearing him. And that's what Jesus is speaking about. And so he's pointing out that he's the door, verse 7. He's the door to the sheep, and all who ever came, he says, before me are thieves and robbers. That's how he describes them. But the sheep didn't hear them. And then he said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So he says, if you come to me, you're going to have liberty. You're going to have freedom. You go in and you go out. That speaks of freedom that you have in Christ. Instead of the legalism that produces regulations, he says, I give you freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. So he says, you're not going to be in bondage. You're going to be set free. That's what people don't understand. They're, they're afraid to become a Christian because they're afraid they're going to be in some kind of religious bondage. They don't understand that coming to Christ, you're set free from bondage. You're set free from it. You have liberty in Jesus. The Holy Spirit works within you, and you have the freedom that comes through him. And he says in verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that's what the thief does. He's saying the Pharisees and their legalism can only bring people into bondage. These people are trying to keep you from coming to faith in Christ, he's saying. And it leaves people in their sins because the Pharisees are not teaching the people properly. Because if they had been, they'd have been pointing people to Christ, their Messiah. Through their rejection of Christ and by their, their, their legalism, they were keeping people from God and they were taking advantage of their followers, and the result was they were injuring them. And he says they came to steal. They stole the people's hearts from God. They stole their hearts from Jesus. They came to kill. They left them spiritually dead by undermining their faith in Jesus Christ, and they came to destroy. They did so through their opposition to the kingdom. But Jesus said, on the other hand, I've come that you may have life, and that more abundantly truth will not only set you free but it produces within you a fountain of life if you hear his voice and you follow him you enjoy fellowship with him you're blessed aren't you you're blessed jesus came that we might have abundance of grace and and peace and and love and and life and joy and salvation that's why he came. I came that you may have abundant life. I came that you would have an overflowing life. I came that you might know what true blessing is. You know what we need to do as a people of God is we need to stop looking at the world as our source of whether or not we're successful or happy. And we need to look beyond that to heaven that's awaiting to a Messiah who loved us and gave himself for us. And I look past that because Jesus made, a, Jesus made a, uh, a statement to us, where my treasure is, there my heart shall be also. The things that I value are the things that give me pleasure and enjoy, enjoyment. Wherever my heart is, my treasure is. And I've discovered that I'm supposed to be putting things in, to heaven and, and not to safeguard them here on earth because the thief will break in and steal and and rust, uh, moth, will, and rust will corrode and destroy. But but with Jesus, no thief can steal my joy. No no thief can erase my name from the book of life. No no thief can take what God safeguards. Jesus gave us abundant life. Are you are you enjoying it? I hope you are. Are you enjoying it? Are you enjoying your walk with Jesus? That's a pretty pointed question, but it's worthy of asking at this moment. If you've got problems, cast them on the shoulders of Christ and trust him. 
He will never leave you nor forsake you. He never lets you down. And no matter what you go through, remember this, you go through. You don't stay, you go through. And whatever you go through, you grow through. And as you learn that, your maturity comes. Have you ever said to God, I want to be like Jesus? If you have, he was the wounded healer. Do not be surprised when you're broken. Do not be surprised when your heart is smashed, when you feel rejected, when you're hated. Because if they hated him, they're going to hate you. And whatever gave me the idea that I was going to be the most popular person, the more I follow Christ, the more I remember he was the wounded healer, rejected by men, spat upon, accursed, killed even. What makes me think that abundant life is having a new car or a better house or a job? What makes me think that? The world, because the world uses that as emblems of success. But what is success? I hesitate to say this, but I'll say this with respect. My wife and I, just yesterday, went and visited a very dear member of our church who's going to go to heaven real soon, real soon. And we went and sat in in the room with, with her and just yesterday, and Marie's kissing her, and I'm there ministering to her and talking to her. And you want to know something? When we walked in, what she said, her husband's there, very dear to us. Her husband's there. They've been married over 30 years, and she's going to go to heaven. And, and, and a husband is watching a wife ready to, to move on. And that's tough if you haven't gone through that. I have yet to go through something as deeply personal as seeing my wife go to heaven, but we haven't gone through that. That's a heavy thing. And you know what she said when we walked in? I, uh, forgive me for repeating this, but she said, my two favorite people in the world are here to see me. And I'm looking at somebody who's, who's, who's about to go to heaven, and the first thing she says to Marie and me is that we're her favorite people. And I was talking to my wife on the way home. That's what matters. That's what matters in life, guys. Not what you drive, not what you wear, not the nice restaurants. Those are all good. Thank God for them. Should he bless you to be able to do that? No condemnation, please don't misunderstand me. But I know that those aren't the things that make you who you are. Those are not the things that make you who, who you are. Who you are is determined by your relationship with him and his flowing through you. In his abundant life, well, you discover. You discover that it's relationship. You discover that God is a relational God. That within the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is relationship. And in relationship, there's love. Because you can't love by yourself. You need somebody else to love. Within the Godhead, there's a reality of love. For God is love. Within that, my Father Jesus said, loves me. There is a love within the Godhead that is now in us through the power of the Holy Spirit that we have for God and for one another. That's how it works. And so it doesn't matter what my shoes look like, and it doesn't matter what my hair looks like or if I don't even have any. What matters is him. And he says, and I'm giving to you an overflowing life, an abundant life that comes from relationship with me. And a thief only kills, only steals, only destroys. But Jesus says, but I give you life. And on Thanksgiving, when I was sitting there looking at my ugly little family, <laughs> and I went today to go see my ugly little grandson, Jackson. That's life. That's life. To hold this little baby in my hands, to look at him. And then to look at my baby girl, who, 
who blessed her husband and me with a child that I can look at and say, God, you're good. Now that's life. That's life. That matters. And that's what Jesus gives to us, relational. Yeah, he blesses us. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for blessing us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You, you gave us heat in this room, and it's so cold outside. You gave us a roof that keeps the rain off of us. You gave us a car to be able to drive here. Lord, we were able to eat today. Thank you. Hot water I can shower in. Thank you. We got a lot to be grateful for, and it all comes from him. But the abundant life is relational with him. It's knowing you're going to heaven and knowing that he will never leave you nor forsake you. It's knowing that when you cry by yourself because you've been hurt so deeply that he has a container that he catches your tears in, is vile, and he doesn't forget your pain, and he goes before you. He knows you by name. He loves you, and he heals your broken heart. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. It's much more than material possessions. It's relationship. You're never alone. Don't forget that. You are never alone. He is always with you. I will never, never, never forsake you, Jesus said. And for that, I'm grateful.